All right, so good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm about to walk through my daily, day-to-day -day operations for my college basketball betting model. So it's uh, the routine I do every morning. I get up, first thing I do. So uh, I'll walk through what exactly I have to do day-to-day -day because a lot of people think that it's just like you press one button, it runs everything, and then you bet what it spits out. It's actually, there's more to that. And um, I'll go ahead and get started and talk about more of it later. So the first thing I do is I archive... Uh, yesterday's files that I consider to be, uh, that I overwrite. That way, in case something goes wrong, I can just uh, recopy and paste uh, some of the files that, um, you know. Otherwise, uh, trust me on this one. Um, otherwise, like if something goes wrong, and trust me, things go wrong in models, it happens, right? If uh, something goes wrong, then it, it can take an hour or two to fix the problem, and it's a pain in the butt, or it can take two seconds to fix the problem if you just back up the files from the day before. So I did that first, and now what I'm going to do is I have a file called box dates. And so what I simply do is I mark a number one next to the days that have been completed. So uh, yesterday was January 14th. So I save that, and then I run the first function, which is box ID cycle. And since I think that's on row number 51 minus 1 to count for the header, so I do 50, 50, and 0. And that way it finds out what the box score IDs were for yesterday. Actually, it should have been 51, my bad. Um, it already got... Uh, dang it. See, I, just, I already screwed up. I already screwed up. See, this is why you back up your files. And I didn't, but I didn't back up the master box IDs file. Eh. So I'm going to have to do that, undo what I just did. I already screwed up once. So I need to get rid of all the... Actually, no, that's fine. <laughs> no, it looks good. But what this function does is it grabs all the box square IDs from the day before. So it should have been the number 51. My bad. All right, there we go. So it's getting all the January 14th box scores and putting the I box score IDs in a file. That way, when I run the HTML scraper, it can uh, know what I box score IDs look for for the links that it pulls. And so now that I did that, I'm going to do box HTML cycle date, and then I just do the start date and end date. So since this file right here, all the green dates mean that it, since all of them are green it means all the box scores were available when I scraped it but sometimes the box score is not available so I color it in yellow or red that way I can pull it again the next day to make sure I pick up the box score that was missing and so now what I'm doing is it's grabbing all the box scores from yesterday and putting them into files this is the scraper that's running right now and if it's missing, it'll say box score missing and then the matchup. And that way I can notate that January 14th doesn't have all the available box scores. And the next day I can go back and try to grab that box score. Because it's really important that you get every team's games. All right, there we go. And so that's every. So what it just did is it put all the box scores into a file uh, right here. Box scores. So I have box scores going back five years. But as you can see, this is pretty, you know, messy. Um, you know, but it's the result of the scrape. And so uh, since all the box scores are available, I can color this green and close it. And so now the next step I do is a command called box score compile. And what this does is it takes all the box scores that just got put into that file and splits it out into the, all the different teams. So each team has their own box score uh, file, so that's what I'm doing right now. And then it compiles the raw totals from those box scores. And it also determines what the last uh, roster was that each team used for uh, roster purposes. So that's what this command's doing right now.
I wish there was a way that when it's opening CSV files that it doesn't put this text right here. That's pretty annoying because it makes it kind of hard to miss errors at times or anything else, uh, but it is what it is. All right, there we go. So now the next step is the adjustments. So there's a lot of steps involved in the adjustment uh, thing, so I'll go through them uh, later. Uh, but I do five rounds of adjustments, so I put the number of adjustments right here in parentheses, so multiple ADJ do. So this uh, pretty much crunches all the numbers from the box scores, and um, it usually doesn't take this long, but I think because I'm streaming, like the, maybe the CPU's running a little bit slower. Um, Let me, let me close some things. Okay, so yeah, now it's running faster. All right, well, while that's going on, I'm gonna do something real quick. Yeah. All right, so. I'm going to, I don't have to do this, but I, I do it anyway because in case there is a missing box score, you still, you still want to get the score from the game. So uh, this is kind of like a backup scores that I get just, just in case there's a missing box score. But there was today, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I have this file CBB odds that I paste these scores into. The score dump. right here and so then it matches all the scores from yesterday into a nice file that my system could refer to and then I'll save that but I'm gonna keep that file open because I'm gonna need it later all right so still doing the adjustments so it adjusts team stats and the individual stats at the Royal the individual portion takes a lot takes a lot longer obviously because there's you know, a lot more individual stats to do. But uh, the individual stats don't go through multiple rounds of adjustments either. It just adjusts off the final adjusted stats for teams. Maybe I'll change that. I don't know, because the indie model that I run is uh, just the numbers are just terrible compared to the others. So there might be something structurally flawed with it. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a pretty big pain in the butt to uh, audit. All right, so that's done. So now um, what I do is I just got the, uh, so now uh, that's phase one of the model. So phase one is, you know, scraping the data and then adjusting it. And so now phase two is what I call the results phase. So um, the results phase is pretty much like recapping the day before. So the first command is box results five. This pretty much uh, gets all the results from yesterday into like a nice frame betting results, not not actual game results, but betting results. And so I'm looking for errors here. There's no errors. There's some warnings, but there's no errors. Uh, but so BR breakdown five set is basically breaking down uh, the results from a betting standpoint. So that's what I'm doing right now. And then the keyer generates the keys you see on the website, not the keys I use personally. Bet value results too. Now we're starting to get into like uh, the games uh, that I actually bet for key purposes. So that was day number six. Yesterday's breakdown, we're breaking down my actual plays. My plays analyze is analyzing my plays from yesterday. And now we're starting, now we're getting into the key finder. All right, so master key finder set. I I need to open the file to see what the last day is. But now we're starting to get into the territory that I did on my stream last Saturday. So if you watch that, this is what I programmed last Saturday. So seven, seven's the last day. So master key finder between days one and seven. And now master key finder is where I uh, manually, this is one of those things you don't want to automate. You want to actually go through. So we're gonna designate what the keys are gonna be today. So I'm gonna sort this by index, which is pretty much units times ROI, I think, yeah. And so, wow. Um, 
So if you sort it by units, I think it's going to be the same. Yeah. So both the, the, the highest index is also the highest unit. So it's team blender ATM simple. Um, so that's going to be my key today, index number 48. So I have a vector called today's keys. You'll see. So 48 is going to be our spread, which is 42 and 16 for 24.4 units. It did really well last night, by the way. I think the team was like 21 and 7 or something which is a reversal from Wednesday where it did really bad. So now uh, totals. So it looks like also the case that the uh, highest unit is also the highest index, which is good. You want to see that because that way you're not having to like, okay, which one do I pick? So this is index number 50, which is the team blender simple combo. And now we're going to look at money lines, which is lag. But last night I finally had some money line hits, uh, so my drought is over somewhat. Okay, so the index, the highest index here is not the highest unit. So I, I'd rather do highest units, um, find a good mix of ROI and units. So this is where you kind of have to pick. <laughs> do I do Blender ATM? Do I do Team Blender ATM? Because if I do the highest index, I'm not going to do one with only two games. You're, you're, that's too picky. You don't want to be too picky. I still haven't made up my mind. I'm trying to pick. All right, let's do Team Blender ATM. So index number 32. There we go. So we have our keys selected. So. That ends the results phase. So now what I'm going to do is collect odds. I hate the website I'm about to go to, but they have the best odds table to copy and paste. So that's why I use it. So bear with me here. I'm not. I don't. I'm not endorsing the site in any method. It's just that one major key, and I've talked about this all the time. But one major factor of a model is how if you need to maintain an odds database. So if you're okay with manually entering in odds every day, then knock yourself out. But in college basketball, there's too many games. So you want to find an odds database that you can copy, right? Like I'm about to do. Um, that way you're not spending hours entering in odds manually. And by, if you enter in them manually, by the time you enter them all in, they, the lines have probably changed anyway. Whoops, I need to unmerge this. But people are like, why don't you do first halves or... Uh, player props or, you know, because you have to, in order to run a good model with keys, you need to have a good odds database to refer to. If you don't have that, then you're not going to be able to run a good model. So, and by the way, the reason I did this video on a Friday is because I thought Fridays, usually in a normal basketball season, Fridays, there's not a lot of games, but there is today. Jeez, there's more games this Friday than there has been any other day of the week this week. So that's why I picked Friday to do this video. Had I known this, I would have done it on like a Monday or something. But anyway, okay, so we have all our odds here in the table. So um, one thing I want to do is just check for neutral site games because there's been random neutral site games this season uh, on days you wouldn't expect. So I just want to make sure there's no neutral site games. And also you can go to this website to see what's been canceled. So I don't see any neutral site games, but there are games that have been posted. One way to easily know it's been canceled is there's a zero for all the odds. But everything else looks good, so it looks like that's the only uh, game on the odds board that's been canceled. So I can save that, and now I can start running the simulations, which is stage, do five, start and end. But I do zero and zero. If I do zero and zero, it'll start at one and end at the last one. Otherwise, I can specify, oh no, what the heck is that? That is the first error I have seen. Oh no, I was hoping this would be an air free. What's going on? Man, bummer. See, this is why you can't automate everything. <coughs> what do you mean the data must match number of column? What's going on here? This is a bummer. <coughs> What if I do, I have the odds. So the error, like I, I didn't want this to be a troubleshoot. So the error's happening in my individual Monte Carlo model for whatever reason. Let's 
So the roster select. See, this is why I can't automate. But I, I never deal with errors. I never deal with errors like this. <laughs> it's been a while. Like they happen, but not not in the simulation that I've run a million times. So something's something's wrong with the roster file uh, and the roster select. So. This is my individual Monte Carlo model, and so what it does is it uses the rosters. So there's something wrong with the away roster. Something's missing from this file. There's 30 columns when there should be 31. Oops. I guess this is educational. So th see, this this one's right. It has so which column is in this one that's missing from Denver's? That's the question. Wait, is Sacred Heart playing? What's the first? It's Oral Roberts in Denver. So let's see what column's missing. Oh, it's the player name. The player name column. I wonder why. So I have a function that actually matches the player names to the that did not run. It's in the one of the multiple ADJ, but I don't see any errors that came up for that. I really don't want this live stream to be troubleshooting, but <laughs> Something you have to do when you run a model. Things like this happen. You to, that's why. You, that's why you have. That's why you have to advise against full automation. Because otherwise, you're going to miss stuff like this. I mean, you're. If you set it and forget it, say you go to the gym or whatever, and then you come back and you see an error, and then you're like, okay, oops. Right. But I have like a name matcher script in here somewhere. I have too many. Well, let me do this. This is a major bummer. <laughs> You know what? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna delete Oral Roberts from the odds today and go get back to that later. If I wasn't streaming, I'd figure it out, but I don't want to bog you down with this stuff. So stage do five. Zero. Okay, it's happening with that one too. So that wasn't that didn't fix it. Dang it! This is what I was trying to avoid. I, I apologize, everybody. <laughs> So something is wrong with the name matching. <laughs> this has not happened to me yet. So naturally it happens to me on the first. Stream I do of this. So the player name is not in here. That's the issue. And that th I don't see why that's the case. Whatever, for some reason, my command, oh, I think I know. <laughs> the in name append command did not run. <laughs> see? for whatever reason. <laughs> oh, you know why? Dang it. I, I ran the wrong adjustment. Dang it. All right, I'm going to start back. At, I'm going to have to do multiple ADJ pre. That's why. 
So I have two, I have multiple ADJ do, do, which is the old one, and that's the one I did. It's actually multiple ADJ pre, because multiple ADJ pre, the difference between that and multiple ADJ do is that it uh, multiple ADJ pre factors in the preseason ratings that I compiled into the ratings. Multiple ADJ do does not, and I accidentally ran multiple ADJ do, and that one's an older file that does not have the name matching. So I really apologize, but thankfully I don't have to go through the results portion again. But let me go ahead and re-add the Oral Roberts Denver game in here. So see, I guess this is educational in the fact that things go wrong. You do, you actually might run the wrong command. You might actually do something wrong. Um, it happens. I'm going to have to go back to this site, which is fine. I go to page two so I can get the Westgate odds. just like sometimes minor things like that could trip you up but no we're, we're good I'm, I'm glad it's nothing that was structural that's that's the that's a good thing because sometimes you run into errors that are structural and you're having to spend a couple hours to figure it out Shouldn't be too much longer, but yeah, we can. We don't have to do the results step again. We can jump straight to the stage do, but the stage do thing is going to take a while. So while it's doing that, I'm going to explain the various parts of what's going on. I would say an average, uh, average day. Uh, this process takes about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, on an average day. <laughs> Almost there. Almost there. Okay, it's doing the name matching now. That's what it's doing. Because it's opening the CSV files to match names. Like, I don't have to have player names in there, but I do. Okay, so we're done. So now I can do stage do five zero zero. There we go. All right, so what it's doing right now, it's running the simulation. So... It runs five different simulations, so it does the Indy, which I think there's something wrong with it because it's doing so bad against the spread compared to the other four. Um, the Indy takes about 13 seconds, then the team takes about four seconds, and then the others don't take any time at all. So about 17 to 18 seconds per game. So on a Saturday, if there's a lot of games, you know it's going to take over half an hour. 44 uh, games, you know, that should take about 11 to 12 minutes. So while it's doing that, during that 11, 12 minutes, I'll, okay, so what it did is it, it gives me the results of the simulation. Um, that way I can just check on it to make sure there's nothing like too crazy. Um, Oral Roberts and Denver. So the combined result of the five simulations is 84 to 70. So about a 14 point edge for Oral Roberts. So now it's gonna run through the rest of the methods. So while it's doing that, I'll explain some of the other things. So. The multiple ADJ pre is important because it does all the stat adjustments. So I'll go line by line and tell you what exactly it's doing. So the first thing it does is it loads the preseason frame, which is the preseason ratings I generated um, for use. And then the next thing it does is compile raw per possession. So it compiles a data frame of per possession stats uh, for every team. <coughs> And then the next thing it does is it compiles the national average, which is important because you want to know what the national averages are. And then we do a game by game per possession log, which is pretty much the same thing as raw per possession, only this frame up here does it for the season stats. And this, game, this frame right here does it for the game by game stats, so per possession stats. 
and then it calculates home advantage, which is this function right here. And then it starts to do the adjustment. So other log splitter is pretty much a command that joins data frames together. Um, it joins the opponent's stats to the team's stats. And that way when you're adjusting it, you know what the uh, to adjust off of. And then it does that however many times I designate it. So I usually do five rounds of adjustments. So it will do the splitter and adjust five times, joining the new adjusted frames to the team stats. And then it creates a final frame of sums. And then it looks for NANs. So if there's any NAs in there, I replace them with the national averages just to make sure the averages don't get. See, this is something that you put. I, I didn't plan to put this in, but then I realized there's a lot of NANs. NAN is pretty much divide by zero. So like, for example, if a team, this, this does happen. You know, it, you might not think it might not happen. But say a team doesn't shoot any free throws in the game. It's going to divide by zero. You're going to get NA, and it's going to throw off the averages. So I just replace it with the national average when the, that occurrence happens. There will be games where a team, you know, doesn't have any blocks or steals, uh, and you want to make sure that it's not dividing by zero. And then we do the tempo adjustments. So the tempo adjustments are different than the other stats adjustments. The reason the tempo adjustments are different is because you're trying to factor in how a team wanted to play rather than how it actually turned out. For example, if a team falls behind early that normally plays at a slow pace, they're going to play at a faster pace, obviously, to try to catch up. Um, so that's not how they want to play, though. And so that's why you do it. That's why the tempo adjustment's a little bit different because you're trying to factor in how they want to play and not how they actually had to play, which is different. It's it's kind of hard to explain. Um, it still gets me every time. I've been I've been doing that style of tempo adjustment for eight years and. I still have to like walk through it step by step when I'm uh, programming it. But really you're, what you're doing is you're using the expected pace of the game, the actual pace of the game, and the team season uh, tempo adjusted stats. You kind of put those all three together to determine how they wanted to play versus how they actually had to play. It's the same thing for a fast paced team, you know, say they get out to a big lead and they slow the game down. You don't, you, you don't want to use that actual pace <coughs> you know, as their adjusted tempo. But anyway, I do five rounds of that as well. Free throw adjustment is a lot less complex than it seems. It's pretty much just adjusting a free throw percentage based on home, away, or neutral. That's it. You know. And then uh, that is the team stats. But then I do what I call the preseason merge. So that's the first round. So I take that data frame of all those adjusted stats. Oh, wait, I forgot this. The team weighted average. So the team weighted average, I take the adjusted stats, and I weight the more recent games more heavily than the uh, older games um, based on how many games they played. So if a team's only played five games, and their fifth game's only going to get like 1.75 the weight of their first game. But if a team's played 20 or more games, then the most recent game gets four times the weight as their first game. So I do that. So then I do the preseason merge. So as of uh, up to that point, the stats have not have no preseason influence. So if a team's only played five games or ten games, you know, I phase out the preseason ratings after a team has played twenty games. But um, no one's got there yet, so everyone still has some preseason influence in there. Uh, but what I do is I run the adjustments again, but this time I merge the preseason ratings into their adjusted stats I've already run um, based on how many games they've played. And then I run the adjustments again. That way you're adjusting off the preseason combined stats, you know, to make sure that there's no skews. So then I run the adjustments again, make sure there's no NAs, do the tempos again. <laughs> free throw adjustment again, weighted average again. So I pretty much do it twice, um, one without preseason and then one with. And then I come up with a master preseason merged frame. So that's the team stats. Then the individual stats. So individual stat box score join, I pretty much just join uh, opponent stats to their box score stats. That way I can adjust them. Totals raw to average, I pretty much just sum their um, raw stats on the season into per possession stats. Individual log to opposition is pretty much like 
what I talked about earlier. It's joining. It's a, that's pretty much the function that adjusts the individual stats based on the opponents they've played. Individual weighted average, same thing. Uh, I weight the individual team's uh, averages. They're more recent games more heavily than their earlier games. Free throw adjustment, same thing. And then name of pen, we talked about that. I append the names because up to this point, uh, there's no names in that data frame. I do that last. And the reason I do that is because there's some teams out there, South Carolina State, I'm talking to you, sometimes in the box score they have their player names in all capitals. Sometimes they don't. That causes problems. So the reason I do that, that's the very last thing I do, is so I only join one set of names to the stats. Otherwise, if you have a player name in all caps and a player name in not all caps, that's going to be two separate lines. That can cause problems, and therefore you don't want to do that. So that's why I just join the names last. That way they're not split out while I'm running the individual stat stuff. All right, so that's, how the, that's the adjustment process. Um, we're about 16 games in, and so uh, what else can I talk about while it's running this? All right, I want to talk about why I don't have this fully automated because a lot of people are like, why don't you just like press one button, run all this, and then you know come back when it's done and enter your games in? For reasons we saw, what if there's an error, right? You want to have various checkpoints along the way. Now, remember when I was copying and pasting these right here and entering them one at a time? Well, I have one button that I press to do all those at the same time, right? I don't enter those in individually every day. I was just doing it for the sake of this video to show you what I'm doing, but... For, you want to have various checkpoints along the way to make sure everything is operating correctly. Because if something goes wrong and you have a fully automated process, you might miss it. And then you're going to be making bets based off of problems. So that's, that's why I have various checkpoints along the way to make sure everything's on the up and up. Uh, and you're like, then you're probably asking, well, wh why wouldn't you automate those checkpoints? I mean, you can, but... Um, just for peace of mind purposes, I don't automate the checkpoints. I make sure that I can actually see with my two eyes that everything is running smoothly. Because what if I had a set it and forget it model and did that and then came back to the error we just saw earlier? Well, if I had a set and forget it model, I wouldn't run the, I wouldn't have ran the old multiple ADJ command, but still. I, b I believe in automating like 90% of it, but you still want to, you still want to make sure you have checkpoints and you also want to know what's going on. If you set it and forget it, then you might be unaware of what's going on. I talked about that in baseball. Uh, I did the same video for baseball this past summer, and I said, you want to be in tune with what's going on every day, right? You want to know who the starting pitchers are. You want to know what the expectations are. You want to know what's – because that way, when you actually see the outputs and you're making the bets, you, can, you know that, okay, that makes sense, right? And even with the set and forget it model, I mean, this would still have to run, right? The, the, the simulations, we're not even halfway done yet. And you're probably like, how come the simulations are so slow? Well, I, I think 13 seconds to do 100, or to do 1,000 simulations of my individual model is pretty good. Like, I don't know how I could cut it down any more than that. Because the individual model I run, I'll show you in the Monte Carlo. <laughs> It has a function called floor shake. And floor shake pretty much randomly chooses five players to be on the floor for every possession. So ev it cycles through every possession and calculates a and randomly determines which five players are going to be on the floor for that possess possession. Now, the probabilities, this, this function right here, sample. So one through however many players are on the roster. So each player has an ID on the roster, one through however many players. And the probability is based on the MCOA share. So there's a, so if a guy plays in 95% of his team minutes, there's a 95% chance he's going to be on the floor for that possession, right? So, and that's what the floor shake does. It randomly determines the five players on the floor for every possession, and then calculates probabilities based off of that, right? So it, you know away shot to probability so it to determine the probability of which five players that have been selected to be on the floor are going to take a two if the Monte Carlo simulations determine that there's going to be a two-point shot on that possession 
Same with threes. So if there's an offensive rebound, it determines the probability of which five players on the floor is going to be that guy who gets the offensive rebound. So having to do that, you know, every possession for every game a thousand times, I think it's pretty impressive as I was able to get it down to 13 seconds. Now, I, like I said, I think there's something structurally wrong with the individual Monte Carlo simulation, and I'll show you why I say that. So look at the Indy results versus the rest, right? Minus 49 units against the spread versus minus 4.9, 3.5, 1.4. So, and it, it did really bad once again last. Like every metric last night did very well, except for the Indy, which did very bad. So now to be 40.9% against the spread, I mean, even if you have a bad model, you still should hover around 50% no matter what over the long run. So I think part of the reason it's doing real bad is just bad luck. But I still think there's something stru structurally wrong with it because it's doing so bad compared to everything else. And I don't see why. It's not like the stats it's using are that drastically different than the team Monte Carlo run, which is the same Monte Carlo simulation, only it uses the team stats instead of doing the floor shake, right? And so I'm wondering if there's something structurally wrong with the Indy. Not that I really care because it's not like I'm keying off it or betting it these days, but the Indy Monte Carlo method was kind of like my crown jewel of everything, and the one that I feel like is the most robust, and it, yet it's still doing so bad. So, um, like, there's got to be a reason why the Indy simulations differ so widely than the team. Um, like, let me find you an example. Like, right here it says that Pacific was going to win by 12, and everybody else had Pacific only winning by three to four. So, like, why is that? I need to, but I've done some audits already, and everything checked out. So, honestly, I don't know. I guess I'll have to keep deep diving. But it was those audits that I was doing where I determined things like, okay, I'm calculating home advantage wrong. I'm calculating 2.3 point distribution wrong. I'm calculating expectation wrong. But still, I haven't st still have not been able to audit why it's so much different than the rest. Like this one had Gonzaga beating Pepperdine by 40. Everybody else had Gonzaga beating Pepperdine in the 20s, and Pepperdine only lost by 25 last night. So once again, the Indy was wrong. So I don't know what the deal is. I'm just going to have to keep researching. But honestly, I don't care because as long as the team, Blender, and everything else is doing well and I can just key off those, honestly, it's not that big of a deal. But um, yeah, there's something wrong with it. All right, on number 30. And so usually when this is going on, I like go in and like make breakfast or something, and then I come back when it's done. Uh, but I don't want to leave the stream. So let's see, what else can I talk about? <laughs> There's something I want to talk about, but I forgot. Um, so uh, the Monte Carlo tab that I have right here has all my simulations in it. So it also has the uh, team possession, team Monte Carlo's in it, which isn't that complex. Like the team Monte Carlo is like not that complex at all. <laughs> and it's doing very well. Like last night, it, it, it was very well against the spread. All right. That was the live betting. If but I don't really use that. So here's the simple, like the simple is only like, the simple prediction is so easy. Like look at that, it's only like what, 40 lines of code maybe? Because um, all it does is it calculates expectation based on offensive efficiency, defense, and te tempo, and compares that to the last on average, calculates expectation, factors in home advantage, and uh, that's it. It's, and then the uh, win percentage is just a simple log five win percentage where I use an exponent of 10.25, that's it. A simple Pythagorean win expectation. All right, the blender, the blender, uh, here is the blender. I'm going to scroll through it, but it's not that long either because the ATM, the ATM is pretty much the blender, uh, which, uh, so let me click off from that so you guys don't see what's exactly in it. No offense, but it's still kind of somewhat secret. But the blender is a linear regression model. Um, 
for you know margin and then it uses a logistic regression for win percentage. <laughs> but it just refers to a database of stats in the past. And that's it. The ATM is the blender uh, that filters the database for similarity of the matchup that it's predicting. So matchups that it deems not similar enough are filtered out and then it just reruns the regression. All right, what else can I talk about? <laughs> yeah, I, I was totally expecting, usually on a normal Friday in a college basketball season, there's like 12 games total and most of them are in the MAAC and the Ivy League. <laughs> But uh, today there's a lot for some reason. So after this is done running, I just do my picks for the day. And then I upload the stuff to the website. So it's not, not too much to do after this. So if you're watching this video when it's not live, you can just honestly scroll through here. So let's see. So the scraper was really just a trial and error thing. It really is. Scraping is a pain. Uh, it's, it's just, that's what scraping is in general. It's just trial and error until you get it right. But what I do in my scrapers, I pull the box IDs from the website. And, and if you notice, like I have different uh, scraping functions because every year it seems like the NCA website changes just a little bit to where you have to account for different things. So I don't know if I have them in this or not, like, because I have a filter out box ID two and then a filter out box ID uh, because various things. So filter out box ID, all what that function does is just gets rid of the non-division one versus division one games. That's it. Switcher like Switcheroo 2018 because in 2018 they had the uh, they put the home team first and the away team second for whatever reason that only happened in 2018 but like I had to do I have that Switcheroo it just switches the home and away teams or the order so away team is first so there's filter out box ID load game day scores. Uh, what this does is it loads a frame. Uh, this is how you get the box score IDs right here. So each year has its own link, and right now 2021 is active, so that's why I have 2021. Grab box score IDs. Uh, it cycles through the, I'll show you what page that I'm scraping off of. It scrapes off this page right here. So um, it, there's a number attached to each box score in this link right here, and it grabs that number. So it cycles through, but it's a pain. It's a pain because all these postponed games and stuff kind of throw everything off. And so when I built the scraper, I was building it off a of past season that had already been completed with no canceled games, and I didn't have to account for that. So when I started to scrape this season and all the postponed and canceled games are thrown off the scraper, I had to reprogram the scraper to account for the canceled games. So like I said, it's a pain. So once it gets all the box IDs, as well as on the current day, it's getting the uh, matchups. Um, so it gets the matchups for the current day as well as the, actually, no, it doesn't do that. That's what the odds, the, um, that's what the score, the odds thing is for. But it, it also determines if there's a neutral site. It uses this as well. And then box HTML cycle data is the cycle that um, actually grabs the box score data, box score by box score, and puts it in its uh, appropriate file. So box teams is kind of like how I scrape that. Um, and if, it's, uh, if the length of it is zero, then it says missing box score, which happens every now and then. Box HTML cycle old is the way I did it in the past uh, because they add, I'll show you, you have to account for this. Like some box scores have a technical foul column and some don't. So you have to like factor in how many rows, columns there are. Yeah, it's a pain.
get team IDs. This is a this is a pain. Uh, sometimes the team ID is different, and sometimes it's not. Yeah. So scraping these box scores is a lot complex than you think it is. So the team ID is in these two links right here, but sometimes it's and uh, it changes every season first of all. So you have to create a new database of team IDs every season. And second of all, um, sometimes it uses its old ID and sometimes it doesn't. But not this year. That hasn't happened this year yet. Get player IDs. So the, w the, way, I, the way I track individual stats is to track their player ID. That does not change every season. So that's always consistent, thankfully. But each, each player has a player ID. See, here's the 2016 box stat, because I had to change it every year, because something changes every year. So anyway, uh, the simulation is almost done, but I just merge ID and box. Like, you have to do a lot of different things to, like, the scraper is the one of the hardest parts. Box fix, box to team, like, I just have different, but that's the end of the scraper right there. And then when that's done, it compiles the team raw sums. All right, so that's the scraper. But anyway, the simulations are done. So now I can move forward. So bet value five is a function that uh, calculates the edges. And by edges, I've already talked about that. Um, the edges is pretty much the value, the betting value that I use for keys. And then uh, website picks one. This is uh, how I get the picks onto my website. Right there, website picks convert um, is just uh, today's the fifteenth. That just converts it into like a friendly format for SQL and master key stripper set. This is how I determine the actual games I'm betting, and then master key stripper. This will tell me what games to bet. And there we go. All right. So now that I've done that, I can actually put my bets in. I like to put these in before I upload them to the website, just, you know. I'm not saying I move lines, but you never know. So I'm gonna go in, ooh, that's a lot of games. That's a lot of games. But yesterday, uh, the, the model did so well yesterday, the keys are probably a lot more relaxed. Like, I'm talking about like 20, there was a point where like the team was like 22 and three against the spread yesterday at one point, or something ridiculous like that. So I'm actually going to put these bets in. Let's pretend I'm doing that just for the sake of the stream. And then uh, there's one more function I do that I haven't done. It's website do all, I think. Yeah. And that like generates all the stuff for the website that I upload. Yeah, if it was less games, I would put them in on the stream. But I'm going to wait till the stream's over to enter in my bets. OK, so now that's done. So there's two things that I do manually. Like I said, I like to have checkpoints, and this is one of them. So I like to just make sure this all looks good. Um, OK, that looks good. And so I have this formatted WTP5. This is what gets uploaded to the website. Um, so I just want to make sure that it all looks good before I do that. And so I manually and copy and paste that in. Save that. And then I do the same thing with the today's plays into my plays DB. So when you click on the SBT's official plays part of the website, this is the SQL database it's referring to. So that's in there. I'm going to keep that open. And then I connect to SQL to. Uh, Upload all this to my website. So I upload all these databases to SQL. Everything's good. And then I check the website to make sure it uploaded. And it did. So we have January 15th is available and all the January 15th plays, as well as uh, SBT's plays for January 15th. That's a lot. I haven't seen that many yet. But um, yesterday, I had a winning day for a change, thanks to money lines. See, 
one and three totals though. That was my first losing total day, I think. But um, let's. I just want to show you how well the Motley. Like, Twenty-one and seven against the spread. Twenty and eight. Eighteen and ten. Eighteen and ten. Seventeen, eleven, and then the Indy. Ten and eighteen. Um, totals weren't as good. Uh, money lines though, a lot of good news as well. But the blender just continues to kick ass. I mean, look at that. So if when in doubt, just bet off the keys that the blender says to bet on. But anyway, that's the day-to-day -day process that I use for my college basketball model. Um, it doesn't take that long, but just for the sake of the video, I kind of you know made it a little bit longer to explain things, as well as that error we ran into. Um, but yeah, um, that's all I have. So if you want to see what a true day-to-day -day process is like for a model and see what you have you know, maintenance-wise every day, that's why I don't run an NBA model or an NHL model, because I don't want to overextend myself having to do that for multiple models every day. Um, Anyway, that uh, is it for this video. Um, thanks to everybody for tuning in.